Thanks for joining Rudy and me. For the last couple of days, we've been talking about the wickedness of the Gentiles from the Jewish perspective. Uh, again, wickedness is using other people or even God for ourselves, making ourselves the center of the universe and seeing that other people serve us. That's a very challenging way to think about wickedness because it's really hard for me to have practiced for years and years using other people and yeah, I'm sometimes nice about it, but still it's about me. So let's, we're now going to turn to the Jews. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. So there are probably Jewish people in the congregation. By the way, there are more Gentiles than Jews. But there are probably some Jews in the congregation who heard what Paul said. Yeah, get them. All right. But he's now saying, well, when you judge others, uh, you condemn yourself. Because you judge, you are doing the very same things. Uh, today, as I was looking at this lesson, driving down here, really and praying about it, I thought about my own life. I am I am guilty. I need, I need God's help. So it says, verse 2, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you'll escape the judgment of God. Uh, let's just stop with that one. Comment on that for me. Well, I'm always, I, I think about Paul saying, I don't even know if I have any sin. Right. I'm not aware. Right. Because he understands the completeness of the cross. Right. And so, for we know that judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Right. Uh, we have escaped the judgment of God if we live by faith. Yeah. Uh, but to be able to understand the story that God had given for 1500 years mm -hmm. up to the writing of Romans of where the Messiah was coming from and that's why Paul puts in the genealogies he doesn't yeah. put the genealogy in but that, that there is a genealogy that's from David mm -hmm. uh, to fulfill scripture all of this is fulfilling scripture Habakkuk of which I read a couple of days ago makes all these statements about the king of the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. And ultimately Paul is flipping that back on ourselves and to, to look at ourselves and to think that the blood of a lamb, by law, it does cover your sin. But how many, if you were to see all of your sins, you would never be able to stop sacrificing. Yeah, it's very right. true. So this, uh, by the way, I, you've heard me say a number of times that I'm a really good speck inspector. Jesus talked about how can you find a speck in your brother's eyes that missed the log in your own. I'm a good speck inspector. And, you know, G Paul joins Jesus and said, come on, Bob, get real. So in verse 4, do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not realizing that the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance? Well, that's a powerful verse. God's kindness is not to be taken for granted. God's kindness is his reaching out his hand and saying, come on, get your life together. Yeah, Max and I were having a discussion Sunday about something that was troubling him about his daughter. Uh -huh. And he was just saying that, you know, he wished that he could have protected her and I said you know and he says I don't know why I wasn't really you know wasn't able to do it there was no apparatus to be able to do it right but the fact is and I told him I said the reason you feel this way is an image of the father right because basically he sent his son and so when you are feeling this way to your children you are image you are being an image of the father right and uh, so when, when these kind of thoughts occur to us about our friends and family, mm -hmm. 
know that you are image bearing the Father because He imprinted it in you. Yeah, you got it. And we think about righteousness as God's act on our behalf, so He is kind to us. He bears with us, He puts up with us, He is patient with us. Thank you, Lord. And He say now, Bob, Rudy, Jewish people in Rome in the first century, don't you realize he's doing that so that you'll change your mind about him, that's what repentance means, and begin living your life differently. He's also giving them, has given them the example that your minds have been darkened, so don't think that you're, that the thought process that you're using right now is the one that will get you to this. Yeah. Because really, that has darkened your mind, and and since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. Ultimately, even as Christians, we have debased parts of our mind that is darkened to what we really should be doing, mm-hmm. or, sh- or how we yeah. should be acting. You got it. So he comes to verse 5, just following on your deal. We, by your hard and unrepentant heart. Uh, what's my hard heart? My hard heart is I know what's right. Even God can't tell me what's right. I know what's right. Let me have my way. That's, that's my definition of hard fight. Unrepentant means my mind hasn't been changed. Yep. You know, even God can't change me. I, I, uh, I say that the person who is unteachable can be taught. If even if I can't be taught by God, who is going to teach me? So, by your heart, go ahead. Well, this gets into why, why did God make us that way? So basically, He gave us free will, mm-hmm. and He knew all of the challenging challenges that the, right. that the people were going to have with free will. But the one thing that He wanted. For, was for us to freely choose him right. in the end. You got it. Absolutely. So you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That's a scary moment. For he will repay according to each one's deeds. Uh, to those who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality he'll give eternal life. While those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but wickedness, there'll be wrath and fury. There'll be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil, the Jew first, and also the Greek. But also glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. I think part of the problem of understanding this passage is what is glory. Mm-hmm. And really, Uh, N.T. Wright is kind of pounding this into my head right now about real glory. What glory looks like is you doing the Father's (coughs) will Uh on earth. And basically, in doing so, you lift up the others around you. Mm -hmm. That's glory. Uh Yeah, that's good. Uh, It's not honors. It's you being... A servant of God, mm-hmm. making, elevating the people around you. Yeah, that's good. And uh, so when we, you know, when I, when I think about that, I, I have. It's not my perception of glory; it's God's perception of glory. Yeah. So when I was in high school, we called the fellow who could run a touchdown and who probably was dating the prom queen and so on, we called him a glory hog because he was getting all the adulation. Glory is not that. No. Glory is walking with God. Hey, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace, and thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to respond to it, we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. You have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.